Welcome everyone to MS Confidential. For those of you who are new here, we gather monthly for candid conversations about life with multiple sclerosis and by default other chronic illnesses as well. We have a really awesome topic today, um, one that's kind of near and dear to my own heart. It's called How We Heal. What does it mean to heal? For some, healing means being free of symptoms and having a clean bill of health. For others, healing can happen even when there is no cure. In this episode of MS Confidential, we will look at the unique ways our panelists define healing for themselves, how that definition changes with time, and it does, what they do and what they do to facilitate healing in their physical, emotional, and spiritual lives. Does this topic resonate with you? It does for me. Um, if so, please chime in with questions and comments during our discussion. You can place those right in the chat box and I'll keep my eye on them throughout the conversation. It's so meaningful for our panelists to hear from you. So please do so. Now, our three regular panelists, all in various stages of MS, First, introducing Elizabeth Jameson, the director of our show, artist, writer, patient advocate, and human extraordinaire. And she just wrapped an essay that will be submitted to a numerous publications. Can't wait to read that. Kyle Chronic is is currently studying for his master's in accounting with future entrepreneurship goals. Kyle, I can't wait to see what you end up creating with your brilliance. He also has a powerful voice in the MS Instagram community, and um, he's often our funny guy, too, over here on MS Confidential, so we love having him. His handle on Instagram is at gotta keep going. And Annie Brewster, assistant professor at Harvard, practicing physician and founder of Health Story Collaborative. Annie also just published an incredible, incredibly important book. It's called The Healing Power of Storytelling. It's full of exercises, reflections, writing prompts, her own, some of her own personal journey and stories from other real patients. Um, she is the superhero of patient narratives. So I highly recommend checking that out. If you want to learn more about our guests, head over to Unfixed Media. You can read about them there. And my name is Kimberly Warner. I am the founder and director of Unfixed Media and co-producer of MS Confidential with Lisa Foote. I am here to just keep the conversation flowing and I'll sometimes chime in with my own chronic illness experience living with mal de debarkment syndrome. So, okay, let's get started. I really, really, really wanna just start by hearing how the three of you Define healing in your own lives presently. How does healing live for you right now? And then we'll go back and talk about maybe how that's changed through time. And um, let's see, Annie, do you want to jump in and start for us? Sure. So right now, it definitely is something that changes over time. Uh, I think for all of us here who have a disease with no cure, obviously it's not about curing how I think about healing. Um, maybe someday there'll be a cure, but not now. And so for me right now, I'd say healing is really about um, being able to be fully in the present moment and feel as vibrant and present as possible and really live my life to the fullest that I can. Um, that is what I strive for. And so that for me involves a lot of trying to get better at self-care, which I'm not always great on like getting mm -hmm. enough sleep and I do, I'm good on the exercise when I can do it, but I'm not good on the sleep, but trying to find that balance. I guess it's about balance, but really pre the word present keeps coming to my mind. Like I want to be there for people, be in the moment uh, and feel like I want to be in the moment. So feel good in that moment. To me, that is healing. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. What about you, Elizabeth? I'm trying to wrap around what um what was just said by Annie uh, I have to think about that oh for me anyway it's it's a serious it's 
life is with a mess is an ever-changing story and dynamic. And I, when I first was diagnosed with MS, and up to probably 10 years, I went and had, to, had a TED Talk, in which I sell, it's called Celebrating the Imperfect Body. My, I'm losing my voice. And I was ecstatic during that talk. I thought, disability is beautiful. Just like, black is beautiful. I'm disabled. I'm happy. I think we should all look at our disabled bodies with curiosity. And I was so upbeat. I don't think it was toxically positive, but I don't know. Looking at it again, I don't know. I was in love with life. I, I I was on high, and over the years, especially this past year, I look at that TED talk and I would, I would never give that again. I'm more <laughs> sobered. So I I've I've changed because I look at that TED talk and I go, oh my god, I don't like it at all, and I would give up very different talk and about the dynamic change that's developed over time. I was kind of depressed this month and this year because I've had new changes that I never thought. I thought I hit back rock, rock bottom and that was when I just that that oh MS is, can't take any more from me. I I'm free and clear. And then what's happening this month has been shocking and really um really difficult for me. And so we we all go through journeys with RMS and now I'm feel like I'm back on it. I'm publishing another article. I'm at confidential. MS confidential. I have a new grandson. So I feel like love is life is great, but it took a while. So I don't think we can say we cure we sometimes cure, hopefully more often than not, but it's it's fluid, and sometimes we don't feel like healing. We can heal. Other times, like today, I'm so happy. I'm like really good mood, loving life, but you know that's changes. And I yeah. try and try to celebrate and thank my body, but sometimes I can't. So, and that's okay. I like that you use that word fluid. Um, I yeah. think you're right on with that. And it's not even like, it's not a straight line of, of change either. It's, mm -hmm. it's um, so Love many variations. Yeah. What about you, Kyle? Yeah. Um... Um, so with Elizabeth and Annie both, um, uh, that word fluid, uh, ever-changing dynamic, uh, it, it is always changing. And um, healing to me has been so multifaceted, just like this condition itself. Uh, am I healing uh, my gut? Uh, I've had gut issues my whole life. I feel like I've done a pretty good job healing my gut. Uh, I'm working on like you, Annie, being present uh, in the moment and trying to improve my quality of life. And uh, yeah, present. I, I like your use of that because that's where I'm trying to be. I'm going to therapy to hopefully heal some mental traumas. Um, and then uh, with some new information from my new doctor, um, I'm trying to heal 
the environmental aspect. Uh, so it's, there's so much that's not even scratching the surface. Kyle, what do you mean the environmental aspect? So I, I did some of these labs um, with my new doctor, a, a mycotoxin lab, like trying to find out if I'm being exposed to mold, like a lot of mold, because heavy mold exposure can fuck you up. Um, and uh, the results came back and my, the, my mycotoxin uh, profile, you probably can't see this, but uh, the, yeah, you can't see this, but <laughs> uh, my mold exposure is off the chart. Like the, the normal range for this strain is 7.5 minus 27.98. Uh, and then this other strain of mold, uh, normal range is 0.4, um, minus 6.04. So I've got these, um, environmental specialists called a healthier home coming mm -hmm. to do an inspection of my home. And they're going to be, uh, looking at not only mold, just any other environmental contaminant that could be a driver in exacerbating my MS. So... Yeah, trying to heal my environment. What what if I'm living in a super toxic place? And yeah. uh, since I've been here, I have I've gotten significantly worse. I've been here for seven years. Yeah. And well, good for you. I, Kyle. I might have to I might have to move. Might have to. Mm. You know, I want to, there's, I brought this question up on the Instagram community yesterday, and this is interesting, just specifically what you're talking about, Kyle, addressing the little physical healings that yeah. need to happen, even if there isn't a bigger cure. And she yeah. said, I love what she quoted, um, there has to be healing with no cure as that's a management strategy and, yeah. minds, and it's a mindset that makes healing possible. So uh, like that. that manage, it sounds like that's kind of the phase you're in right now. You're in the management phase. Yeah, I'm just picking it apart. Yeah. Doing it piece by piece. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. that's really important. Yeah. Annie, you're nodding your head. Yeah. I think that that makes so much sense that the piece by piece is really the only way we can think about it. Um, yeah. And I was also sort of thinking about the medical profession and how they think about it. I mean, I, we, I, I am one of them. So I, you know, but I have been frustrated by the medical system that way more as, you know, as a patient, but also a doctor. But I think doctors are sort of trained to think that we're supposed to fix it. And so that right. is, but that is equated with healing is fixing it. And then right. there's no other, there's no, there's so many other aspects of healing that are not addressed by the, yeah. the traditional Western medical system. So just, how do you think, Annie, and then you guys, Elizabeth and Kyle, you can answer this as if what you would want from your physician, but how can physicians facilitate healing when there's no cure? Well, how do you facilitate healing? I mean, I think, you know, the, first of all, I'll say that the system really works against uh, providers and patients and makes it hard to cultivate a healing environment just because it's so um, curtailed the visits. Right. But ideally for me, it would mean a doctor who really made me feel seen and heard and understood and like asked me questions about my whole person, my lifestyle, my priorities, what matters most to me, what I want in my future, what I dream of. Um, and also is willing to tell me what they know, but also willing to listen to me when I don't want to follow a particular path they might suggest uh, and will ac accompany me on the journey yes. as a partner. That's what I would want. That is my new doctor. That's amazing. Cause he, I think uh, my yeah, follow-up appointment with him uh, just uh, Monday, Monday or Tuesday, I spent another hour and a half with him one-on-one -on -one, just going over all these labs and potential things that we can tweak to optimize what I got, what I'm working with. Um, which, which is amazing. I mean, that's so hard to find Kyle. Like, so is, is it out of pocket or does your insurance it, cover that? Well, them? that's the thing. Um, it's, 
they are pretty hard to find um and they're super expensive so it's very cost prohibitive um like my first uh, appointment with this dude with all these labs was uh, $2,500 or so. And they don't accept Medicare or uh, any insurance, really. Um, but I, I'm okay paying for something that's, this is, he calls himself a functional medicine practitioner. Um, he's a super knowledgeable MD. And I, I want my body to function better. So the Functional medicine seems to be working really well. Oh, I'm so happy for you, Kyle. Yeah. I've heard good things about those functional medicine doctors. They're um, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Elizabeth, what does healing look like to you with your physician? Or what could it look like if you had a healing experience with your one of your care um, healthcare practitioners? Just if my healthcare practitioner would listen to me, ask me questions, listen. And, and I want to bring you to my doctor. He yeah. I left that place. I, I never leave a doctor's appointment dropping four hundred dollars and being all chipper and hopeful and so <laughs> optimistic. I was, I was, I had a great uh, appointment, and then it just made my day. That never happens with any other doctor. So is it what I'm going to play dumb here, guys? Because like, so what you're saying, I hear that like, these are the things that make you feel good. So what is the actual healing? So, so you walk out of that office, you felt hurt, Elizabeth, if you felt hurt, what's healing in you? Because your body's the same, right? I, for me, it's like feeling held is the word that comes to mind. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not burdening. It's not only my burden that somebody is walking with me and helping with take some of that weight off my shoulders. That yeah. when you have someone who's your guide and you trust, you can relax a little. And for me, that's healing when I don't feel I have to manage it and stay on high alert all the time. I think doctors need to be uh, give a more uh, optimistic prognosis, even if this is a shitty prognosis. Um, none of my Western medicine doctors have made me feel good about what I'm dealing with. They're like, well, you're young, at least maybe, maybe we'll come up with something. I think that's key. It's like keeping hope alive, but yeah, that, yeah. that requires, I think, continually redefining hope, right? It, it does. It, indeed. And I think there is an importance to being realistic to like honest, like you want the honest right. facts, but you also right. want there's always hope. You just have to redefine it. What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. Like my my diagnosing uh, neurologist told me that I would be blind and in a wheelchair by the time I'm 30. Um, That's just arrogant. When I was, when I was 21, I was yeah. like, damn. That's just arrogant. Depressing. That's stupid. It's stupid. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm... Not, I'm legally blind in my left eye, and sometimes I use a wheelchair, but that was, mm. Yeah, that's not right. Filling my head with just pessimism. and. What did you do with that, Kyle, when you heard that? Did you just kind of throw him the bird in your head? or Kind like... of, yeah. And I, that, I, I think that motivated me to just advocate for myself and find anything that I could do to uh, improve anything, any aspect here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and can you go into that a little bit more, Kyle? Like, how did you facilitate that? Like, what were, yeah. what were some resources that you found or developed in order to establish that new version of healing for yourself? Uh, I'm so glad that early on, I think just the first few months of me being diagnosed, somebody mentioned to me, Dr. Terry Walls and reading her book, Minding Your Mitochondria. Um, and I followed Terry Walls and her her diet, the Walls Protocol that she, she released the book in, I think, 2014. Um, and when I follow a diet that resembles her, her diet, um, it, uh, my body just functions better. Um, and then 
something okay i got uh trained doing transcendental meditation uh so that's just piecemealing it here doing the gut and my microbiome uh the meditation has helped me cognitively so much um and uh physical therapy has been so so big uh i was just reading somewhere that physical therapy is the most underprescribed disease modifying therapy um wow. uh, i've been doing i i do it now twice a week i was doing it once a week the past couple of years but uh doing it twice a week so it's lots of little things and i got mm -hmm. some new just business ventures going and mm, <laughs> kind of mixing that in with my health care um that's awesome that. it's a full plate <laughs> it is so, um okay i want to chime in personally two seconds here and maybe elizabeth yeah. and annie you can relate my experience was different kyle absolute okay. respect to you i tried everything and mm -hmm. had no success like for two yeah. years was just like wow you know i am going to be fixed i am going to be cured and I tried wow. everything under the sun from natural medicine to Western medicine. And it just actually was making me worse and um, wow. could have been the biochemical state that I was in. Cause by pursuing the cure, I wasn't right. allowing the more psychological healing and relaxation to use Annie's word. Holding on to it so tight. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, my healing has to has been so much more on the psychological level i still it's live so with good. what i had eight years ago and is it a little bit better yeah i think i'm managing it better but i think it's also i've just embraced it more yeah um so oh, how about what does that bring up for you guys when i tell my story hi i've learned to really embrace my ms and be friends with it i know it's sounds strange but i really feel it's part of me so i have to love it and be friends with it and swear at it mm -hmm. occasionally um, a friend enemy but it's really letting in and it's trusting that mm -hmm. i will figure out how to come out of whatever depression or funk i have regarding my new symptoms Mm. I, I really like to have my life filled with joy and remember, I have to remember the joys in my life are so plentiful. Mm. I, I, yeah. My writing is joyous to me at times. At times I hate it. At times <laughs> I feel very joyous. I have a grandson that could see lots of joy. My kids, my friends, my caregivers, who I love. So I, I, my life is filled with joy. So I, that's my goal in life is curiosity and really contemplating and be thanksgiving, have thanksgiving for my joy. I love that. I was, I'm so glad you said the word joy because that kept popping into my head too as sort of healing. And I keep, I kept conjuring up like the Dalai Lama for some reason, just like his ability to feel joyful and to really, I don't know, laugh a lot and, yeah. and appreciate the joy. But also to your point, Kimberly, I, I totally resonate with what you said about the healing yeah. being psychological. For me, it was too. It was like, very much uh, a journey of having to learn how to accept. I, I admire where you are, Elizabeth, really loving your illness and seeing it as a friend. I still think I'm not there, but I think that I have accepted and integrated it into my personhood. And it took me a long time to do that. That was my struggle and my journey. Um, sometimes I think denial can be healing just a little. <laughs> <laughs> I really think that's true. Yeah. Yeah, say say more about that, Annie. I want to hear more about how the denial is healing. 
I mean, I think it can be very adaptive at times to help us survive. Um, it's not it's not helpful, I think, if you get stuck in denial. And I sort of did. And then I had to learn how to integrate and move forward. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, it sort of set, it relates to what Kyle said about like physicians need to give us hope. It's not even, I don't know if this related to denial, but I felt like my physician threw it all at me all at once. Like you have yeah. this, I'm going to certainly take the medicine right away. And there yeah. was no... And I think I would have done better. And I do this with my patients. I never withhold information, but I'm more willing to say like this points to maybe it's this, but we, ha we still have things to investigate and we don't know for certain yet. Let's take it one day at a time, one step at a time. Like I had one lesion on my spinal cord when I was told very aggressively, I had mm. that diagnosis. I would have, I, and I went into denial and that helped me survive for a short time. But I wish that doctor had said instead, this is MS is a possibility. Let's yeah. follow this together. Let's see how it unfolds. Like people can't absorb that all at once. And so I think denial can be helpful if we're overwhelmed with something to help us get through it. But right. that's two different thoughts. Like I think doctors can, could hand us, there's a quote in that book, um, um, when breath becomes air that I love. It's like, a terrain of tragedy has to be doled out one spoonful at a time. Mm. Yes. And I like that quote because to yes. me, that makes sense. Yes. And it does probably come back to, if you want to just put it in a scientific way, it comes back to the biochemical state because I do feel like how we receive that information is going to affect yeah. that physical experience of those symptoms um yeah. you know if we were all buddhas we would be like okay cool just give me my cancer diagnosis yeah but no and, and just to the denial thing again like my mom just sent me she's this so captured my mom because she's always like i'm fine i'm i'm so fine even when she's not she's <laughs> like maybe she is toxically positive but it seems to work for her <laughs> And anyway, she sent me at some clip on like the oldest person in the world who's like 115 now, or maybe even older. And there was all these quotes from her, from this very old woman that, and it was things like, I love wine. You know, that was one, but another <laughs> was like, I can't see, I can't hear my body hurt and everything's great. That was how it ended. <laughs> I love it. And something's working for her. <laughs> So Trisha is chiming in and asking, when do you know when to make the shift in your healing definition or do, is it conscious or does it just sort of evolve or what, what's that, you know, those different, we all agree that healing definition changes with time. So it has changed a million times. Do you know, is it a conscious decision? Like, shit, I really need to change my definition of healing right now. Or is it just sort of happen? I think it kind of, ha I think those are almost like synonymous, like making the shift is part of the healing. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Like you get to a point where you're like, this isn't working. And then it has in the next step of, of accepting or healing yourself, you have to make that shift, but they're sort of almost too tangled up in my head to sort out. I don't think it's conscious on my part. It's like something tells me I have to, or I'm not going to be able to make it forward. Mm, yeah. I know I, my moment was a family member uh, said, what if you live with this forever? And I was so not in, I was like, miss little miss fix it, you know, and <laughs> it was year two. And I'm like, that concept was not even part of my reality. And when she said that, like I was mad <laughs> and then it sort of slowly worked its way into me and it ha it shifted so I was like oh I can't live with that reality inside of myself if that is my reality out here um so for me it was like a conscious decision of like I better shift something because <laughs> this isn't good yeah it was definitely conscious for me too I mean when I was diagnosed at 21 I was like fuck this this is not going to be my life dr gupta uh, <laughs> yeah i don't know maybe like i don't know what's conscious what's not for me too it was like i was rejecting denying 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 and then 
I did at some point say, okay, I have to accept this, but I can tell <laughs> the story retrospectively. Like, I don't know that I was actually thinking that clearly at the time. Something just made me think I have to accept this, but it's easier for me to say there was this turning point moment where I said, I'm going to accept this. No, it was very gradual. It wasn't one moment. It was a very long process. So I don't I know. Still that still don't accept it. Uh, working on acceptance therapy with my therapist. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll report back. <laughs> oh i like trisha's question i just saw it in the chat mm -hmm. yeah yeah let's well elizabeth you were saying something let's hear that i want to hear I, for me i am long try to embrace my diagnosis and i'm in the process always in the process but i like their goal of embracing yeah it's a safe home for me my mm -hmm. ms is my safe home yeah. even though it's sometimes a very uncomfortable home but i it's it's part of me elizabeth i remember once you describing it as like this beautiful bird sitting on your shoulder and i loved that image but it just does it feel like a separate thing like the bird or does it feel like part of you how would you how do you conjure up your ms well i don't say a bird on my shoulder anymore that's <laughs> long gone the bird is long gone <laughs> he, he, uh, ran off and <laughs> found a girlfriend a boyfriend and <laughs> left me in the dust um, <laughs> I just I think you need to write a children's book about this bird, Elizabeth. I, <laughs> I like Sorry, it. Go ahead. I I just keep wanting to surrender to everything and realize I don't have control over much of anything and be happy mm. about the surrender. I don't know. I just am in love with it. Uh, word surrender it is such a good word oh, there's a deep calm I felt that when I finally because it was so d willful the previous experience for myself and when I did it did feel like what a relief I could just put it down I feel like that's what I'm going through right now too because I've been I guess that's kind of considered acceptance um but I feel so much lighter these days and I don't know. It's, I know. I think often people think surrender means like giving up, but it doesn't. I think it's I, I, like you, Kimberly, I was holding on so tightly to what I thought needed to happen. It needed to happen a certain way. It had to be perfect. Ugh. And it, it never was. I mean, and holding on to any of those expectations kind of brought me down <laughs> yeah yeah and then you get to finally meet yourself yeah. as you are yeah and if you're elizabeth you even get to love yourself as you yeah. are you know and fall in love with yourself yeah. as you are <laughs> oh it's a work in progress i like that <laughs> question uh do people give you unsolicited yeah on healing but uh yes oh Yes. <laughs> I've had so many people oh, be like, wait. oh, yeah, my, my mom used to have MS. <laughs> um, and she just did this crazy retreat thing, and she's healed now. She's she's all cured. I am the opposite. Uh, I am an Android MS. She's dead. She died of MS. <laughs> okay. <laughs> More people who talked about people, they died with MS. It was a horrible yeah, thing. Wait, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, so helpful. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I get. I always get people coming up to me about some yeah. try this, try that. I I do seem to have a mental block against Terry Wall's book. I should check it out if you. I hate that book. I hate <laughs> that book. I hate Terry Wall. I, I'm sure. So yeah, but Kyle likes it. I um I I'm I'm not feeling Terry Walls these days because I get emails from her every fucking day 
And it's or it's like, try this. It's only this amount of money, but you get a discount if you use my code. I'm like, uh, I don't like you profiting on our suffering here. So uh, yeah, the profiting thing is huge. I, I mean, mean uh, yeah. uh, just diets. There are so many diets that are kind of like what she's uh, telling us about. Um, and I mean, everybody's different, so nothing's yeah. gonna. I'm sure everybody. there's some wisdom in it. I don't know why I've had a mental block. I've had a lot of people tell me I should get a stem transplant. I I got I, I, I left the country it. for stem cells and yeah, it was it did uh, you get you had that done? I left the country and I went to the stem cell institute in Panama. Wow. Uh, twice in 2014. And uh the results were kind of bordering on miraculous all right uh, but unfortunately it was uh not it was not a solution because after a year um i did start to decline again so, um, benefit and it's a lot to go through for holy shit yeah i started a gofundme um and i was amazed by the response i got so many people donating money. I raised thousands of dollars within just a couple of weeks. And um, somebody just before Christmas of 2013 told me uh, the, the stem cell Institute gave me a call and said that uh, the procedure had been paid for in full anonymously. And it was $25,000. Uh, wow. Uh, really? Amazing. Yeah. Crazy. So it still gives me chills. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I I was I did just read a very good book that was by Megan O'Rourke. It's called the In An Invisible Kingdom. I thought it was really good. Invisible. Yeah. Sure, I have it wrong, but anyway, Invisible Kingdom. Yeah, she's writing about sort of these um, invisible illnesses that mm -hmm. don't have a clear diagnosis. And even though MS has a clear diagnosis, I think so much of about about it is so not understood and so yeah. so variable. It almost feels like multiple different illnesses. I don't yeah, multiple symptoms, and it, and it can feel like that that it's one of these. And well, the, what what made me think of the book is that she spends like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on all of these different modalities she's trying, well, right? Yeah. And so that's something I'm like skeptical and scared of, like all these people suggesting things and maybe they're helpful, but they cost a lot and maybe they're really not helpful. Right. It's hard to navigate that. I'm yeah. willing to try anything and everything under the sun uh, that could potentially give me some better days. <laughs> I'm so I I'm was to a point and then I just stopped. I was like, I, I went to the best of the best of the best and then I was broke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I got better when I stopped chasing, you know? Right, like right. That better, that's again, better, the healing. Yeah, the so, psychological. So hard to sort out. It's so hard mm -hmm. to sort out who's like, like there are a lot of good people out there who are really smart, who are doing great things. And there are also probably a lot of people who are trying to profit and only profit. Yeah. It's really yeah. hard to sort out. And, it, and I hate feeling exploited. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, that, that's why Terry Walls has been leaving a bad taste in my mouth these days. Huh. Uh, How I, I want to. Um, so we're talking about like these people that are selling cures and these this pursuit of the cure for those out there that are still in that chase or and I don't even want to say chase because there's nothing wrong with it. It's it's what we do. And it's not even like a you evolve out of it. I think you just go through phases or whatever. For those who are in it, how do you soften your grip on the curing trajectory? Not softening and not letting go because we don't want to, again, say that that's bad or that you yeah. shouldn't be doing it, but how do you just soften your grip around it so that you can allow this other, these other experiences of healing to occur alongside the, the curing trajectory all i know is when i was officially diagnosed of having progressive disease i got so happy because so interesting oh maybe you're muted now elizabeth yeah you just disappeared elizabeth i really want to hear what you say me too 
Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> Something just happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know Elizabeth is laughing, which is what I love about Elizabeth. <laughs> Are you there? Are you there? <laughs> He'll come back. Okay, Hi. I'll read you. Oh, good. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I when I think I was saying when I was diagnosed with progressive disease, it was the happiest day of my life because then mm -hmm. I stopped searching for a cure because there was no cure. I thought, oh, this is great. Now I I can't control anything, and now I, it's for official. It's all downhill. I, I thought it was great. I didn't have to keep searching for the new um, clinical trial or the new drug, the new transfusion. I just thought, oh, I now I can lead my life, and I start my day with this gorgeous waffle. That I get at Whole Foods and, yeah. and a really strong coffee. And I love it. It's very unhealthy. I love it. And before, when I saw that I could have a cure or that it was undergoing treatment that may lead to a cure, I wouldn't have done that. Now I just say, like, oh, I love my waffle. And you could start smoking cigarettes too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm joking. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> no, and coffee, I'll give a plug. Coffee's good for you. There's a lot of good d data on how coffee's good for you. So keep with the coffee and the waffle. <laughs> I, I know it's yeah. good for me. I get so happy when I yeah. have my waffle, crunchy waffle, and my espresso. I'm in heaven. So your suggestion for people how to soften their grip on curing is to get an incurable diagnosis. <laughs> have your waffles and... And then have a waffle. No, just surrender um, and have joy. Find what gives you joy. Yeah. And, and be grateful for the good things in your life, which I have to remind myself I'm not grateful every day. I should. It's all every day. It's practice. Mm -hmm. Can I read this to you guys? This is what someone else, this is so perfect. She wrote in on this question around curing and healing. And uh, her name is Julie. And she said, I think the deepest healing happens when there is no cure. We are forced to look at all of our parts that we I might agree. have abandoned in the relentless search for a cure. I agree so much. Isn't that beautiful? That is yeah. beautiful. Yeah. My advice for softening your grip on all this is get that word cure out of your lexicon. Yeah. yeah. That that does not that is holding on to that. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know. I I I know where my mind is going is like there's like things you can control and things you can't, but maybe I'm just obsessed with control. Because I'm thinking, well, there there's still things that even if you surrender that there's no cure or that yeah. there's no use in pursuing treatments anymore, as in your case, Elizabeth, there's still things in your day that you can control that might make you feel yeah. better, right? So yeah. I think it's about choosing what you can control and letting go of what you can't. I agree with that. Yeah. 100%. Brilliant. Brilliant. I guess what I can control is what gives me joy. Like yeah. my physical yeah. therapy, I love my Me physical too. therapy. Me too, I love physical so therapy. I'm doing something that I can control, but it, it, it has to give me joy. Yeah. Or a smile. Yeah, that's been something that I've been doing that has made me feel lighter is just adding things to my life that improve my quality of life. Right. Uh, like I'm... I, I love to be spontaneous, so I've just been having random spontaneous date nights, uh, and I'm like, hey, when you get done with work, just meet me down in the car. We're going out. We're doing something. 
Good for you, Kyle. Uh, it, it, it's so much fun. It, I, it, it gives me so much joy. Like, we'll go to a movie, or uh, last week or the week before, we went out to this local brewery with some of my friends for this trivia night. And yeah, we're, it's, okay. yeah, it's very enjoyable. Yeah. I think for me, part of it is like also letting go of the shoulds in my life. I'm still yeah. not very good yeah. at that, but I'm, I'm getting better with time with age. Yeah. Experience COVID actually really helped me get over the shoulds in some ways yeah. it's like the bad word. break and social stuff I was like when I've been emerging from that I'm like I no longer have any desire to spend time with people I don't really want to be around I won't do it exactly. anymore yes I will I can't do the small talk anymore really I'm not I'm not I'm just not I don't have the energy for it but that feels like a positive healing move for me to be, accept that yeah, yeah. that can These be tough great I mean, I, I hear, listen to this. These are the things that you guys are just sort of recap, like summarizing. Okay, we create a poster of like resources that help he facilitate healing when there is no cure. Doing things I can control, being mm -hmm. spontaneous, being creative, Elizabeth, writing, you know, your essays, Annie, writing your book, uh, being present, doing the things that bring joy, mm -hmm. letting go of the shoulds, I would add in like joining patient groups or community groups where you can share with other people, therapy, acts of service, um, reading patient memoirs. Like that's a good doctor should hand that pamphlet out. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Anything else to add? Resources that help healing. Smoke a little weed. <laughs> Psychedelics. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my new, my new my new doctor. Uh, I'm eating some some mushrooms that um, have great lion's mane. It's a uh, often mm -hmm. used as a crab cake substitute, uh, yeah. but it has uh, super great neurological benefits. And my new doctor, he was like, "Have you heard of uh, psilocybin mushrooms?" Um, <laughs> I was like, "Yes, actually, I'm very familiar." Uh, he's <laughs> like psilocybin uh in conjunction with lion's mane and reshi and the other healing mushrooms uh can do wonders for for the brain i was like yeah. all right doctor i'll get on some magic mushrooms uh, <laughs> kyle read uh michael pollan's recent book it's called how to change your mind okay it's all about that, that sounds familiar psychedelics yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. great or you could audiobook it or whatever it's great you'll Love it. Yes, I will. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, probably hanging out with your grandson. You might add that to your resources list. Yeah. Oh, my best joy is when I'm with a group of people with MS and mm. other chronic illnesses. And I laugh so much just teasing each other and saying how ridiculous we are. It's just, mm -hmm. it was so much joy and yeah. that's awesome i'd say laughter is key right or not taking yeah. ourselves too seriously learning how to yeah, laugh learn to laugh yeah yep. annie when yep. we first get to know each other we would laugh and laugh <laughs> we just you crack me up i cracked you up okay. i just we had so much fun definitely Let's do an episode on the funniest shit that's happened with chronic guilt. Let's just la have a whole episode about laughing. Okay. That's good. Mm. That's good. <laughs> I got stories for days. <laughs> <laughs> I really got to think about this. <laughs> I'm going to actually pay, cut and paste this here into the chat so other people can... I mean, I don't know. I really think that having this list of resources is helpful yeah. to Good job, and, and for all of us, you know, we're coming with, you guys are coming up with the ideas here, but we forget, right? How many times yeah. do you wake up and you feel like, oh, I'm so lost. I don't know how to do this anymore. Yeah. Like every yeah. other day. 
<laughs> I think yeah. is gratitude on there because I think Elizabeth said something about gratitude. gratitude super what, yeah, I did a little like last year. I was good for a while of doing a gratitude practice of just every Me morning too. writing it. But I I fell off. The, you know, I'm not doing it Me anymore. Too. I got to get back on that. It was helpful. Little yeah. thing, just yeah. it can be a little thing. Yes, gratitude practice here. Okay, I'm putting it in there. Did you did that go to everybody? Okay, yeah. There's more, I'm sure, but yeah. Wait, I only see part of it. Oh, that's weird. Why did it do that? Mine just says therapy, community group. Yeah, that's therapy. wrong. I don't know yeah. why it did that. Let's try that again. What? Try that. There we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I would love to hear the audience how they heal Same. or mm -hmm. how physicians or physical therapists heal so we're all in it together <laughs> weed uh. <laughs> <laughs> you said it um, I didn't hear so I had an interesting conversation earlier this week um one of our friends, some of you know him, Dylan, he's dying of ALS. He has terminal mm -hmm. cancer and he, I mean, terminal ALS. And probably within the next six months will choose to leave this world um, yeah. because he doesn't want to exist being locked out, which means he won't be able to communicate that he wants to go. And I'm interviewing colleagues and friends in his inner circle that have been affected and impacted by his life. And one of them was one of his professors from medical school. And I asked them all at the very end, what are your wishes for Dylan? And mm -hmm. his professor said, keep on healing, Dylan. And I, you know, we know he's not healing from ALS. And that was his wish. He said, keep on healing, Dylan, mm -hmm. because when you heal, the world heals yeah. and I thought that was so beautiful yeah, um, right. yeah you know like wow um what does that mean to you I know what it meant to me but what does what do you think he meant by that everything that is on that list yeah yeah <laughs> and keep growing and you yeah, you know growing. yeah learning Curiosity, Elizabeth. Stay open. Curiosity. Stay open. Yeah. yeah, stay open. Yeah. Yeah. Curiosity is so important to me. It's like, yeah. wow, I can never get bored. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you come to that point where it's time to go and maybe you're healed. You know, like all of those things come culminate to this final exhale of going, ah, oh, I did it right, you know, or not right, but I did it well. I did we this. We don't know thing. what death is. Maybe, maybe that's just a brand new journey. Yeah. 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 Maybe, there, maybe there is a right. I mean, right for him, right? right yeah. him. It's not the same right for everybody, but it's right for him. Yeah. 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 It's pretty beautiful to think that we can heal even when there's terminal illness, right? Yeah. Um, and curiosity about death. I'm really excited yeah. to learn about death. Yeah. The whole process. I'm curious. <laughs> I'm terrified. I don't want to talk about it. Terrified? <laughs> I yeah. am. I'm terrified. I'm not. I don't like. I'm very scared of death. But I'm going to work on that. Tell me about it. Um, I just, I, I don't know. It, it scares me. It always has since I was a kid. I, I love being alive. I want to be mm -hmm. alive. I'm scared of thinking of the, un, the oblivion, the unknown. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. You're not alone in that one, Annie. Mm -hmm. and being a part of the progressive MS community. I think about death a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not obsessed with death but I I try to embrace my death and other people's death because it's appropriate for me mm -hmm. yeah feel like you have are you at a place where you have peace when you think about that or is is it scary to you at all or I'm not at peace 
but I'm, I have gratitude for my life. Mm -hmm. And I think I need to embrace death. It's an ever going process. I'm not at peace with death. How I want to live forever, but it's just <laughs> it's, but it's part of life. Yeah, it is. You will live forever. Mm -hmm. In some form. Yep. Well, and in you all the people that you've touched too, you yeah. live on, and and literally, we live on in each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, talking to Kimberly in the other life, I'm going to ask you all sorts of things. Oh, yeah. Actually, I always suggest if I, I, you know, if I go before all of you, if anyone wants to be haunted by a really nice ghost, I would yes. love to be your yes. ghost. Yeah. Vice versa. Please be my ghost because all I right. really, really, really want a nice ghost in my life. Yes. Like, all right. Heard. <laughs> heard accepted makes me happy <laughs> yeah well we have three minutes left guys um lisa hello lisa do you want to join us <laughs> hang on just a second hi hi hang on do you want to um do you have anything last yeah i just you know if anybody wants to jump in on this so as I was listening to you, I was thinking, how would you all want the dictionary definition of healing to be for people living with chronic illness? Because I mm. pulled up the new Oxford dictionary and it says it's a verb, heal, verb of a person or treatment cause to become sound or healthy again. That's so finite. Yeah, right. in what regard? <laughs> to correct or put right. An undesirable oh. situation so no. i'm just curious like if we could add another line of definition. It's, <laughs> no it's it. like it goes back to the fluid that came up it has to be yeah. more fluid. yeah, yeah. open fluid. Cut. Mm -hmm. that's a that's a big long sentence it's a run-on sentence in my head um yeah. there's so much to it I think we should, maybe Kimberly, and when you put out these questions, maybe one should be, can write a definition of healing. We should collect different definitions. I'd love to see yeah. that. I like that. Okay. Well, I, I really that. think too, when we're, when we're having these discussions with you all, that defining things is important because I find that lack of definition. Definitions are so important. Are, or just the accepted term in the dictionary is yeah. where a lot of miscommunication happens absolutely I agree. unnecessary misunderstandings I assumptions agree. all of those things and so elizabeth knows when she and i write together i'm like i need you to define that because otherwise people are going to make assumptions of what you mean like right. even when she uses the term human i'm a human being okay what do you mean by that you're a human being not a what like yeah. a, an other a robot uh, so i think for people to embrace people living with uh, chronic illness and disability, I think it's important for us to think about and for you all to think about your definitions of things instead of yeah. just letting people accept whatever the going definition is, so. Yeah, I like that. Okay. And they can change. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have one definition that's always gonna be. Yeah. It's a subjective definition. Yeah. Yeah. Webster should have like their Wikipedia version of the dictionary where it can constantly be updated, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. The Webpedia, Websterpedia. I don't know. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. We got to wrap up, guys, but thank you. Thank you again. Awesome conversation. That was Everybody. my favorite episode of ours ever. Me too. That's a good topic. Yeah. Really good. good note taking, Kimberly. I like having the list. That's helpful. <laughs> we should Thanks revisit. For... We should revisit the same topic a year from now and yeah, see if our definitions have changed. Thanks yeah. for adding to the healing, y'all. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Good, good point, Kyle. All right. You guys, guys want to? Yeah.
watch other videos, go to Elizabeth's website. Um, come visit us next month. Yeah. I love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.